Hello and welcome and thanks for joining us for this debate on the future of education organised under the auspices of the Integrated Education Fund and part of Filium Fubble's debate series throughout the festival this year. Thanks to the wonders of technology, we're able to do it online and we're joined by an excellent panel. I'll be introducing them in just a second. My name is Jim Fitzpatrick and I'm just here to help keep things moving along. So essentially this event is a contribution to those series of debates that we have every year at the festival. It's the first in a series of webinars which is organised by the Integrated Education Fund on the themes relevant to the upcoming review of education, which is an independent review, to help encourage conversations around what we think the future of education should be, what we think the structure of education here in Northern Ireland should be as we push forward into the 21st century. Now the webinar will also explore the questions around the system of our education, you know, how it's divided is one issue, integration of course is one issue, but there are many others too and we're not limited just to that. Uh, youth representatives from the five main political parties were invited to take part. We're delighted to have four of them with us uh, for the debate uh, and let me introduce uh, them to you. Uh, we have uh, the SELP youth chairperson, Carl Duncan. We have Sinn Féin youth, Ogre Sinn Féin chair, Keevan McCann. We have Alliance Youth, Councillor Connie Egan, and we have UUP Youth, uh, Ben Sharkey. So thanks to all of our panellists there from the parties. We're also delighted to welcome to our panel Dr Matt Milliken from the Ulster University, and we'll hear more from Matt in just a moment. So Ulster University researchers Dr Stephen Rosen and Dr Matt Milliken have put together this presentation to stimulate the debate. And essentially this is to pose the questions that we want to dive into in our discussion it's a lively presentation which hopefully challenges and encourages some discussion. You may not agree with what they say and hopefully our panellists will have different opinions on what should be done about the issues they raise. But let's hear from Matt and from Stephen. I'm Stephen Wilson from Ulster University. I'm Matt Milliken. I'm a researcher at Ulster University. As part of the Transforming Education Project at Ulster University, Matt and I have written a lot about those bits of the education system in this part of the world that are not working as well as they might. We're full of praise for the work of teachers and school leaders and many other professionals working in education, often unsung, but we would both agree that there needs to be fundamental change. And that's threatening to some people. You're taking away our culture, we hear, from both sides. And the accusation can be made, perhaps with some justification, but what would you put in its place? You're going to sweep away a divided system of education. What does an undivided system look like? Well, that's what Matt and I are going to explore in this webinar. Let's start the debate. What would it look like and how would it work? Thanks, Stephen. The government in their wisdom have announced that they're going to do an independent review of education with a view to introducing the single system. Today, we want to start people's conversations about what a single education system might look like. How would it work? How could we ensure that it's open to all? Through this event, we want to stimulate public debate and discussion. And who knows, those involved in the independent review might even be listening. The system that we have at present works to the benefit of those pupils who gain places at conventionally, academically orientated grammar schools, who gain high grades and access places at prestigious universities. It has, however, been shown to be failing those young people who are unable to access places at these grammar schools. And that a long tail of underachievement affects those living in communities that suffer the greatest levels of deprivation. The current system of selective education doesn't level up. It preserves privilege and subsidise the education of the already wealthy. The system divides not only by class, but also by religion and community identity. And that division is not cheap. It's been said that segregation across Northern Ireland costs about £800 million per year across the board to maintain that. And that cost applies in education as well. We just can't afford it particularly when funding for other services like the NHS are facing real pressures. It's challenging to work out exactly how much we would save if we were to move to a single system of education, but there have been some estimates. Deloitte and Ulster University independently have come up with an estimate which is very similar. Around £57 million every year would be saved. That's a million pounds a week. 
And some estimates put it at much more than that. There's an estimate of 95 million that would be saved if we moved to a single system. And it's not just savings in that way. We bus children uh, across the province, not to their nearest school, but to schools that they wish to attend. And that costs at least another 20 million pounds, according to our research, and probably much, much more than that. 130 million miles are traveled that don't need to be traveled each year to attend schools uh, just because they happen to conform to your community or because it's a selective or a non-selective school. And if we move to a system without segregation or selection, only 4% of learners would actually need support with home school travel. At the same time, over a billion pounds has been spent over the last 10 years bringing our young people into contact with one another. People that live in the same country and we're spending money to bring them into contact with one another. So, although it's very difficult to get an exact figure, we can conclude the cost of a divided system is huge and it's too much. Part of that cost is the consequence of a system of administration and education that is mind-blowingly complex. An army of administrators and a multitude of administrative authorities, boards, councils and commissions are paid all out of the public purse. It's in the interest of each to protect their own sector, to maintain separation and to keep the cash coming. Each sector has its own way of selecting governors. All valiant volunteers, but a proportion of these are chosen for their loyalty to an ethos rather than their skills in the management of personnel, property or finance. Changing demography has led to the closure of many small schools. But the complexity of ownership responsibility and unresolved legal wrangles means that everywhere empty schools are lying rotten. Rather than saving money, or better still, putting money back into the system through selling off sites for commercial use or uh, housing, the authorities are obliged to maintain and ensure the safety of these mouldering monuments to a failed system. Religious discrimination is embedded in school policy and law. Schools are set up so that the majority, or possibly all, of the governors come from the same faith community. Christianity has a protected status in school assemblies. The RE syllabus has a limited focus on non-Christian faiths, and clerics are permitted to inspect the delivery of RE in schools, while the state's own education and training inspectorate can only enter the school to inspect RE if they have been specially invited in. Governors are empowered to act to ensure that the ethos of the school's founders is protected. Whilst almost every worker in almost every workplace has been able to call on the protection of employment for, uh, for fair employment laws since the early 1970s, it remains perfectly legal for schools to discriminate between applicants for teaching posts solely on the basis of the church that they attend or don't attend. It's unsurprising, therefore, that our divided society is reflected in the makeup of schools. 93% of our young people are educated in schools alongside people largely from their own community. And it starts at the age of three. Most preschools and nurseries are divided by religion, our research found. And report after report show that being educated together in the same classroom as those from other communities is the best way of developing social cohesion. Some worry that it might mean people giving up their community, their tradition, their beliefs and, and, and so on. But not at all. We need schools that will celebrate all traditions and not just the Catholic Protestant ones. The 21st century has brought a very welcome injection of diversity into this part of the world. One in 20 of our pupils are now newcomer children. They are part of our community as well and it's time all of this was reflected in how we educate future generations. So let's talk about this fact. So we're going to sweep away the current divided system of education. Mm -hmm. Look at a single system of education. Ah, so we have a hidden agenda here. What you're really pushing is integrated education. You're saying every school has to become an integrated school. You say potato, I say spud. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it a unified system, a community system, a common system, all children together system, inclusive education, joint education, shared, uh, 
no, no, that one's already been taken. Call it anything you want. Just don't get hung up on labels. But we've been talking for years about educating people together, and, and uh, survey after survey has said that people want that. They want people educated across the divide. But what would that really look like? This new system, single system, needs to be based on a set of key principles. It needs to be grounded in the values of the society that we wish to help to create and to serve. It needs to look to the future, not to the past. What is needed now and in the future, not what was appropriate then, or this is how we've always done it. It needs to be less wasteful. We need best value. We need to make the best use of the available resources, physical and human. It needs to respect the diverse society we have. It needs to be inclusive of all groups together, not just those of the same faith, the same community background. It needs social cohesion. Absolutely, Matt. And the environment as well. A single system has advantages in cutting emissions and pollution, particularly minimising homeschool travel. We talk about the unnecessary travel that there was, many parents unnecessarily driving their children about. Um, our research says 20,000 extra tons of carbon are emitted into the atmosphere from that travel alone in North Ireland. And it's effectiveness as well that we want in our schools. At the end of the day, schools are there for helping learners to become the best they can be, to give them all the opportunities that we can provide for them. A single system of education can do that more efficiently, more fairly, and vitally, it also brings communities together. From the evidence we have gathered, it seems that if this vision is to become a reality, then the independent review will need to pay particular attention to six strategic areas. Firstly, they will need to address the current structures that are responsible for the management of the existing system. And the costly pattern of duplication needs to be dismantled. The system that replaces it needs to be rationalised and simplified. Places will still have to be afforded to those vested interests who have been engaged with educational structures for so very long. But they have to sit within one structure where no concern as a majority are a victim. School governance will need specific attention. There are too many boards of governors and many of them struggle to fill, fill all of the places that are available. Many governors are appointed by affiliation rather than skill. Schools need to be governed in clusters, not individually, with greater inputs from parents and by boards comprised of individuals who are selected by their skill set, not their affiliation. Teachers, in terms of initial teacher education, we had a world-renowned educationalist, Professor Pazzi Salberg, who came over and gave us some ideas about what we could do about initial teacher education and its fragmentation in Northern Ireland. And his advice was ignored. We need to look at that again. Northern Ireland's too small to have four teacher education providers. We need to look at ways of doing that, a number of different models, a common college with twin campuses in Colmaine and uh, Belfast or Derry or whatever. Uh, but whatever way we do it, crucially not divided by denomination. And we have to address pre-service teacher skills as well, ICT skills in particular. Uh, and also teaching uh, is, is now different. Teachers are increasingly teaching in diverse classrooms and we need to prepare them better for those diverse classrooms and in ways that promote inclusion. What we teach has to change as well. Our present curriculum in Northern Ireland has been about for about 15 years and the revised curriculum as it once was. Very exciting development, active learning and so on, but it needs updated, it needs reset, it needs rebooted, and aspects of it which have declined in importance. Citizenship, for example, which was core to the revised curriculum when it was first rolled out, has largely lost its way. We need to come back to that and look at that again. We need to have a curriculum that accommodates diversity and cultural perspectives. And what about empathy education? The RE syllabus needs radical revision if we're going to secularise schooling and ensure that it's inclusive and representative of our current society. It needs to accommodate all faiths and none. 
It could, for example, include empathy education, promoting acceptance of diversity, and better equipping teachers to address contentious issues in the classroom. It's a chance to look at our education system as well. COVID-19 has exposed a lot of the aspects of education which actually are not working properly and which we need to improve upon. What about a baccalaureate system? And there should be opportunities to learn Irish in every school as well and to play a range of sports in every school as well. Look at some of the content in the syllabuses as well, in the specification, the history specification. Many teachers are already doing this in history, of course, but it can be avoided teaching about this place and how we got to where we are and its difficulties and challenges it should be a core part of every youngster's um, education. The current structure of school sectors needs to change. There needs to be an end of selection at age 11. We need to restructure the school types. Preschool age 3 to 4, primary schools with a variable starting age up to the age 11. Then follow something along the lines of the Dixon Plan, with a junior high school from 12 to 14, followed by a senior high. Or do we look at a system which is fully comprehensive, one which involves uh, all young people inclusively? So you go to your local primary school and then you move to your local post-primary school. Uh, inclusive, all ability schools uh, serving the children of their neighbourhood. That's another way of doing it. And finally, funding. Those schools who agree to the benchmarks we've suggested here would receive 100% funding. There would, however, be significantly lower levels of funding for those who opted to remain outside the system. These proposals are likely to affect and meet resistance from grammar schools. If they are to survive, these schools may need to consider other ways of funding themselves, becoming private, fee paying. So let's wrap this up, Matt. Will I move to a single system of education be easy? No, it will not. It's going to be very challenging for many, but we have to do it, nevertheless. And will it wipe away the divisions in our society straight away when it's implemented? No, unfortunately, probably not. Uh, schools will still be attended by one side or the other. There's, there are structural divisions that this will take time to embed into change. So the residential se separation of us keeps us apart to some extent. What about the haves and haves nots? Is that going to be addressed by this? Again, probably not. It's an incremental process. There will still be schools in affluent areas uh, and that will still attract schools, uh, children from uh, well-to-do families. But there will be many other places that will change our society fundamentally and for generations to come. Uh, it'll release funding that can be used to be targeted where it's needed most. And I think we can agree in the value of that. And I suppose ultimately the question isn't should we be doing this, but rather can we afford not to do it? Well, thanks very much to Matt and to Stephen for that engaging presentation. Hopefully, it stimulated a few thoughts amongst our panellists. Uh, I'm delighted that Matt is going to stay with us if we need his guidance at any point throughout the discussion. But really we want to hear from our youth panel members from the different parties. Uh, so let me just uh, bring them in now. And uh, thank you guys for being part of the discussion today. So let's maybe just go through your, uh, give you a chance to respond one by one as to what you think are the key points that have been raised by that presentation, where you might differ or where you think uh, we need to prioritise as we look to rebuild education here uh, for the 21st century. And perhaps I could start with you, uh, Ben Sharkey from uh, the Ulster Unions Party. Ben. Thanks very much. Um, thanks so much to Matt and the, the whole Ulster University team for that presentation. It was good uh, to see. Uh, I think in terms of the priority for me, I think speaking about a single teacher training system is absolutely at the top there, you know, if you read the teacher exception of the uh, Fair Employment and Treatment Order, it reads like a relic, you know, that that could still exist and that sort of is something that needs removed ASAP, you know, that's that's where it all starts, or no matter across the system, whether it's maintained or controlled, 
you know, teachers are the thing that's united, so you want to make sure, not that our teachers aren't a good stock now, but, you know, at the very least, it's an outdated thing that needs moved on from. Um, I, I suppose as, as well, I, I, I see the um, message of the thing that integrated education of secondary level and primary school uh, level is very important. I think in terms of way, it, it is just exists as one of many problems to me right now is uh, the thing that I'm thinking. I think uh, in terms of other pathways after secondary, uh, in terms of uh, renovating schools, which are standing well now, but they need more funding to repair themselves. I think it, it, it's just one of many problems. And the one you know, that we would all hope uh, will be addressed in one fell swoop by the review that's coming soon. And fingers crossed for that. Um, I think in addition, we also have to, as you say, this this isn't something that will, uh, you know, take effect in the immediate and help in the immediate. So another priority for me is the students that are currently in, who may hear great a few years down the line, integrated education uh, may get properly uh, be a proper institution right now for those students. So that doesn't affect them. So I think there has to be more funding and push those great shared education projects we have now, be they politics plus, be it stuff that the Northern Ireland Youth Forum are doing, which is bringing a lot of people across Northern Ireland together. That sort of stuff needs to have funding and needs to be publicised now because that's the things that can help our students who are currently going through and um, bringing them together and get them the chance to meet those new people. So if you listen, Ben, thanks for that uh, summation. I'll get bring everybody in before we start sort of uh, not getting back and forth a little bit. Um, Carl Duncan is here from SELP Youth. Uh, Carl, uh, what do you think needs to be prioritised and what do you take from that presentation? Thanks for uh, having me here, Jim. Um, the thing that I would say needs to be prioritised is the actual review um, and our education system. I do think um, that the review into the education system itself um, has to be prioritised. I mean, it was committed to a new decade, new approach, but it itself would allow us to tackle, um, as you say, the sort of vested interests and that sort of um, whole culture within the administration of the schools themselves. The way I see it is that um, religious division is built into the various school foundations, um, which is, to say the least, quite unfortunate um, in terms of pursuing actual integrated education. But there's a lot um, to be done. I mean, the uh, review and the education the education system itself is just the first step. Um, I think that a single uh, educational institution um, for actually, uh, instead of having Strand, Millis, St Mary's and the others um, there, I think it, we would just be better to have the one. Um, and essentially, I think that is the big step um, forward that we need to look at as well. I mean, I was, I was having a read before this and um, read a statistic that in 2011, 18% of um, students at Strand Mellis were Catholic and 0% um, percent of students at St Mary's were Protestant. And that's just astounding. So when we've got the religious division um, from primary school, the whole way up to um, you know, training to become a teacher, we are sort of perpetuating the whole cycle of maintaining that division within our education system itself. I don't think that there's necessarily, I think that it's a weird question about prioritization of any issue. I think that the review is the first step, but what we need across the North is an entire root and branch um, approach to completely reforming the education system. Um, it has to be an entire focus from primary school, the whole way up to um, teacher training and um, those sorts of things. I mean, and then you've got the whole future prospect as well um, as nationalists, and I'm sure we'll come on to this later. There's uh, the argument to be had that, you know, for example, in the United Ireland, um, most uh, primary schools are managed by a Catholic authority. Um, and so there's an argument to be made there. Well, we need to look at that. I mean, if we're serious about this whole thing, um, then we need to look at that as well and say, well, if we're actually serious about a shared Ireland, then we need to have a shared education system in the future not just try and build one now and then have problems with it later down the road. Um, so I'll not give a long rambling answer because I'll, I'll leave that for the rest of the call. Um, <laughs> I think a root and branch approach is entirely appropriate and it's what's needed. Thanks very much, Carl. Yeah, there, there is a lot to cover, but thank you for, for, for covering those bases. We will get back to some of those. And I think some of the, the you talk about vested interests and you know the challenges that are here, which people might perceive as you know cultural threats, if you like. We'll, we'll dive into those a little bit uh, 
as we progress in the discussion. Um, so uh, Connie Egan is here from Alliance. Uh, Connie, uh, what are your thoughts and what needs to be prioritised and what do you take from uh, the presentation there from Matt and from Stephen? Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you for inviting me along here today. And um, Matt and Stephen, your presentation was fantastic. Some really interesting things uh, to listen to and think about. Um, I think two things that really stuck out for me um, was the figure I think Stephen quoted was it costs £800 million a year um, for this division in our society. And that includes in our education system. And I think the other thing that Matt mentioned, which was really quite um, concerning, is that our fair employment laws um, don't actually apply to teachers. And I agree with Ben um, when he mentioned that needs to change and Alliance are bringing forward legislation. And I think every party does support that. So hopefully that is something we can see progress on. Um, but for me, I think um, for education in the 21st century, I think we need to look at what we actually see the purpose of our education system. Um, is it to tick boxes and um, is it to try and get students um, just the best grades they can get under whatever circumstances? Um, for me, um, I think Matt also alluded to this, I think we need to actually change what we see the purpose of our education system. Um, I think we need to look at it in terms of well-being. And granted, some schools have already made really good progress on this, but I personally think a success story of our education system should be a child or a young person who is happy, healthy, confident, and capable of forming positive social relationships. Um, the pandemic has really highlighted a lot of issues such as the digital divide and inequality in relation to free school meals. But I think it's shown us that the focus of our education system currently isn't on the well-being of our children and young people. Um, as I was saying, Matt, I think you mentioned empathy education. That's something that we could really incorporate into making sure that our children and young people are happy and healthy individuals. And I think that would be a success story of our education system, not one that just produces the best grades for, this, for the school to report on, or no matter what the circumstances. I think we nearly need to shift our, our focus on what our education system is there for. Connie, thank you very much. Um, some interesting thoughts I will try and um, delve into. And the big question, as you say, what is the purpose of education? And, and that's maybe where the, the review needs to start. Um, finally, just from our panel, um, before we get into you know, picking apart some of the particular issues, uh, Keevan McCann is here uh, from Ogre Sinn Féin. And Keevan, uh, what are your thoughts on what needs to be prioritised? And again, what do you take from uh, the presentation, anything that you, you support or anything that you challenge? Yeah, well, Gar Margaret, Jim, and Gar Margaret, uh, the math as well. That was a great presentation. Um, some of the shots are, I think, were Spielberg esque. So, fair play to you, brilliant. Um, no, absolutely. And I think there is a, there's a level of, of agreement here among the panel in the sense that education does require an overhaul, um, not only in the North, but you could actually say across, I suppose, depending on your political persuasion across both the islands as well, because there's certainly parts of the education system in the 26 counties and in Britain as well that, that could be restructured and, and could be made more accessible to people, certainly. Um, one of the models, perhaps, that we could go down uh, and, you, and use is perhaps the Dixon model, um, which, which Matt had referenced in the in the presentation there. And I think that just that just, just facilitates that easier transition into, into those higher levels of education. Um, but I think, the, the, I think particularly there, Connie um, from Alliance made a good point in saying that we do need to get to the point where, where we analyze and where we make a decision collectively as a, as a, as a society as to what is the purpose of education. And purpose, pur the purpose of education for, for myself certainly would be to build well-rounded and forward-thinking and outward-looking people, um, not just exam centers, not just getting people um, so this, the best grades, because there's there's other ways that you can measure how successful a person might be, and that might be the practical skills that they have. You know, we should also be looking at the likes of um, the likes of apprenticeships. Um, we we know that some of the the, the skilled jobs that, that we have nowadays are are sometimes better paid than some of those jobs that you might get coming out of university. So it requires an over an overarching look at it as well, and not just in terms of youth education, and but adult education too. So in my view, education should be nearly like a like an escalator as Jeremy Corbyn referenced like going through your life so you can get on and off it at any point you want so it shouldn't matter whether you're 30 40 50 if at that point in your life you maybe want to make a change or you want to you want to educate yourself a wee bit more then then those facilities should be available to you and I think funding is a is an important thing as well there should be absolutely no class divide um, within education you should walk in the door as an equal and you should walk back out of it as an equal as well um, I was very lucky in the sense that I did get to go to a grammar school come from a working class community in West Belfast I got to go to Rathmore so I appreciate how lucky I was to go to a school like that and the way that I see it is that everybody should have the opportunity to access that level of education and that standard of education 
it shouldn't just be because at age 11 I get lucky uh, and done well on a test. It should be there for everybody to access and that quality of education should be there from cradle to the grave. And that would be my position. I would say that that would be the position of many of us on the panel here today. So thanks for having us and certainly looking forward to an interesting back and forth as well. So Garmila Magov. Thanks indeed, Gurma uh, Keating. Um, so uh, lot to delve into there. Uh, and again, you're agreeing with that need to look at the fundamental, you know, what is the point of education? Um, just before we get back to, to, to some of this, uh, Matt, if I could just bring you in, um, you know, when we talk about the vested interests, um, you know, it's on the one sense, people think, oh, well, I'm happy to get rid of administrators. I'm happy to get rid of bureaucracy. That all sounds easy because everybody can always sort of uh, you know, say we don't want uh, bureaucrats, but, you know, the reality is that means you're talking about getting rid of perhaps uh, structures uh, that are supported uh, by big cultural institutions, say uh, the Catholic Church, for instance, you know, where Catholic education is seen as an important part of, um, you know, Catholic uh, religion. Uh, so it's not as easy as just saying we want to get rid of uh, bureaucracies. And how do you persuade people? Uh, that um, this isn't a threat to their culture. You're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, the first education system, national education system in Ireland, was introduced in 1831, and uh, it aspired to a, uh, a system of education within which religion did not focus. Uh, that there was uh, religious instruction took place outside of the school premises that the religious authorities were not involved in the management of the schools. So that was a vision in 1831. When Ireland divided and the uh, Northern Ireland government looked at education in uh, 100 years later in 1923, again, there was an act to try to uh, set up a system of education that was secular uh, in essence, that uh, the churches weren't involved in the management of the system. The, the churches weren't involved in, uh, in the teaching of RE, again, that RE was outside, and that uh, teachers would be employed without reference to their religion. Um, but those pressures came to bear in both of those instances from strong church influences, strong societal influences, not just on the Catholic side, but on the Protestant side too, to make sure that a certain ethos was preserved uh, and maintained. But that was... 200 years ago, that was 100 years ago. We have a different society now. We do not have a society any longer that is simply divided along Catholic, British, Protestant, Irish lines. There are a lot of people who identify with neither of those labels, or at, at times actually both, to be British and Irish at the same time. Um, so there's, there's elements of, uh, of the old system uh, which are hanging on. Uh, it, and which are no longer appropriate. Uh, the last census identified that 25% of the population identified not with Catholic, Presbyterian, Church of Ireland, or Methodist Church. That was, uh, that was 10 years ago. We've got a new census coming out. I would be very surprised if that figure hasn't increased. Yet those four churches have still got a primary influence on the drawing up of the RE curriculum and the uh, and the management of schools. Okay, I'll bring our panel back in on this, and, and you make an important point. It's not just the, the Catholic Church because people hear about Catholic education, but the 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 well, the other sector, uh, control sector, or whatever, has a strong influence from uh, the Protestant churches as well. Isn't that right? Um, Absolutely. The Protestant churches sit on the governing bodies of those organisations. The Protestant churches hold assemblies in the uh, in controlled schools, and if you look at the uh, uh, the uh, iconography, for want of a better word, around a controlled school or around a maintained school, one reflects a British identity and the other reflects an Irish national identity. Okay, Kevin, uh, just coming back, uh, you know, I mean, these are difficult issues. Uh, you know, a number of people have mentioned maybe the idea of single uh, teacher training, uh, changing uh, the exception to the fair employment law so that... Um, you know, schools operate like everybody else and, and, and can't discriminate on the basis of religion. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, the Catholic school system, which you yourself said you benefited from. Um, but if you were to have these sweeping changes, you'd be, you know, perhaps taking away St. Mary's training college, teacher training college in, in West Belfast. 
uh, perhaps taking away that sort of cultural influence between the primary school and the secondary school uh, that, that is a big part of Catholic education. Uh, and, uh, you know, how do you persuade people that that's a good thing? And is that something that you would ultimately support? Yeah, well, you raise a, a number of good points there, Jim. Um, and what I would say is, I think the, the way that we went around it, about it last time in terms of attempting to close down some areas, and that was something that, that my organisation, Ogre Hinfein, did play a key role in campaigning against, was the wrong decision to make. What you were doing there um, was essentially removing a higher education um, training college from a, from a working class area. Um, that 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 college has benefited um, for for over a century. So it's about how we do it, and it's about bringing people along. So I think everyone has to appreciate as well that this is going to be a long term project. You know, this isn't going to be something that we're going to sort overnight. So it requires long term thinking and long term planning. Um, so absolutely, integrated education is something that, that I support. Um, absolutely. Um, I think it's, I mean, it took me to age 11 until I maybe met to the first Protestant um, in my life. And that was through a, through a summer scheme um, in the Murray. So it, we, we can't leave it to the age 11 and age 12 before young people are, are meeting someone from the other community or, or other communities too. Um, but you're right, it's, it is about bringing people along, it's about bringing people on board. And how we do that, I think, is democratise education and democratise the functioning of education uh, and the, 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 the governance of education too. So um, Matt made a very important point that, that parents need to have input into the likes of Board of Governors or, or more regional setups in that sense. What, what I actually think is an important point to make as well is that pupils also have a role to play in the governance and the directions that their schools go because ultimately they're the ones that are receiving the education they're the people that are in the schools probably more often um, than anybody else so it's about democratizing it so that people do feel that they have a role to play in where schools are going and where our education system is going and then i think that that will be an easier way and a, and a more effective way of bringing people along and bringing people along with this process when they know that they have a hand in it when they know that they have a stake in it and they know that they themselves and their community and um, that they exist in and, and the pupils as well can have um, can have a bit of a sense as to where their education is going. And I think that's the most important thing is putting that bit of a democracy back in the education. So that it's not just highfalutin boards of governors, but that the people that are receiving it and the people um, that are benefit, benefiting from it do have a, a role to play in it um, as well. So I think that's an important way of maybe addressing that particular issue. Okay, thanks. Um, Ben, let me bring you back in uh, just on this point. And again, you raised the idea of a single teacher training um, you know, facility. Uh, do you think it can be done in a way that isn't seen as a threat? You know, for instance, the economic benefit uh, of, say, St Mary's, as Kevin has mentioned, in West Belfast, an area which has suffered a lot from economic deprivation. It's a big employer in the area. Uh, so how do you, you know, make these changes without saying we're taking employment out and away from areas like this, which have benefited from it? Yeah, and I, I think, as you said, that there's, there's logical... Uh, there's logical arguments for it, and sometimes in Northern Ireland, maybe the logical argument is the best way forward with all that. But uh, you know, you've got to try and get that across. I think you've also got to try and get across. You know, there's whenever you talk about integrated uh, education, I think mean, there's two ways you can think about it. It's either the mantra "we're all the same," or there's the other way, which I think is more realistic. We do have differences in upbringing, differences in culture, but that's what we're going to learn from. That's what we're going to grow together. You know, I, I went to university and. Uh, I've been, and I've had the occasion to meet so many people with different uh, ideas and beliefs that are now uh, in my friend group, and I, I've enjoyed that occasion. So I think if you can get across the community, first of all, in terms of the cultural side, that, you know, um, it's that idea that you, you want, you just want their, your, their children to mix with other children, and then hopefully everyone's the better for it. I understand that, it, as Stephen says, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation, a delicate situation, because it is. Can we see us taking the jobs um, from an area if there is any way that, you know, per view, it can be done more as a reformatory way or to meet standards or maybe not sacrifice that, that'd be fantastic, but that's for smarter people than me to look into. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example, like, you know, could St Mary's, for instance, if it changed its name and its ethos, could it be the centre where it is? Could it be the centre for the single training education authority? I, I personally, I personally believe so, and I think that is definitely something that uh, should be looked into. But obviously, I'm I'm not from uh, that community myself. I'm not a Catholic myself, so that's up to themselves. I know it's very important to them, their their beliefs, and also that that is more for um, 
them to decide and but I, I think it's definitely something that can be looked into and maybe if it is packaged that way as you know everyone's adapting as opposed to we're cutting you out um maybe that that is a way it could be uh, dealt with a bit cleaner i also want to completely uh, back keaton's point that we need to be speaking more to students and uh, pupils uh, about their opinions on matters as long as we're definitely packaging to them you know while we want to know their experiences in their current situation and maybe say going back to primary school we also want to make sure that we're asking them about their worries about the future because we don't want it to seem like we're just preparing to make sure the next load of students have a good time. We're forgetting about you, what went wrong for you. So there needs to be some promise that we're also looking to try and preempt into their future and get there early. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Ben. Uh, Connie, let me turn to you. Uh, and we're not just talking about obviously integrated education, uh, but when you talk about making savings, I suppose that's, you know, it comes up in, in, in different guises, whether it be the teacher training or whether it be, you know, right down to nursery education and all the different schools and systems of management that we have. Um, but, you know, Matt made a couple of points in his presentation, uh, which in some ways maybe sounded innocuous if we're going to secularize education and have a secular education system. But that in itself is, is obviously highly controversial for many people. Um, and maybe people don't appreciate, you know, how unsecular education is here, you know, across the board. Uh, so do you think we can move to a system where, of secular education uh, where, you know, whether it be what well, currently is, say, the control sector or, say, the Catholic primary sector, where religion uh, isn't, it isn't a, a dominant Christian ethos, but one where religion is, is part of the curriculum and not uh, the dominating sort of cultural ethos, if you like? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question, Jim. Um, and just to put out, of course, first of all, I mean, the Alliance vision for education is an integrated and sustainable system that delivers equal opportunity for all children to develop their, their unique personality, talent and ability together. And um, as has previously been mentioned, we do support um, a single teacher training college. Um, in regards to what you mentioned about secularism, um, I don't think the goal is to um, achieve a purely secular um, education system. Um, a school with a religious ethos is not the only place where those who practice that religion can do so in their educational setting. Um, integrated schools should not be thought of as places where culture and religion are diluted because it's actually quite the opposite. Um, it really encourages understanding, engagement um, of pupils from other backgrounds and even includes them as part of their religious ceremonies. For example, integrated schools, their classmates will go along to um, First Communions. It really um, engages those students um, to learn from each other, respect each other and really understand that. Um, so I think that's important as well. We're not trying to take away from anybody's religion. We're actually saying that we can bring together and bring something really positive out of it. And the integrated ethos at the minute is um, to ensure inclusion of people from different religions, cultures, genders, abilities, and socioeconomic backgrounds. So while it would include people who would consider themselves secular and practice no religions, it would also be very inclusive of those who think religion is a very important part of their life. And that comes into their educational setting as well. They would learn from that in their integrated schools. So um, I think there's a place for everyone really here. And I think we can have a schooling system if we want. And if we, can, if we try and make it happen, if there's political will to do so, we can create a really good system where everybody is free to practice their religion, to express it in a respectful way and in a way that other people can learn and understand from that. Can a school, just on that ethos point, if you were moving to a single system, obviously you can't have, um, if you think about integrated education, maybe some people think of, you know, 50% of one religion, 50% of another, or, or some sort of balance equivalent to that. But let's say you've got a school which is, you know, almost 100% one denomination. Can it move to a sort of more integrated ethos, even if it has small numbers that aren't, you know, from one dominant community or otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of the sort of quotas, as they're called, the integrated schools put in place, we do think there could be a need to reform that. Obviously, if we're looking towards a single integrated system, um, those um, would, would have to change in some way. Um, but I think the ethos of including everybody from different religion and cultures, I mean, I think that would apply no matter where the setting is, that inclusive ethos that is throughout the school um, could be in place, even if there's a more dominant religion than what we currently see in integrated schools, which is the sort of quota system they have to balance that off. But there's absolutely no reason at all why if there was a much higher percentage of one religion that that school couldn't be inclusive for others. I mean, no reason at all. Great. Um Carl, let me bring you in. Uh, we haven't heard from you from, uh, for a little bit. Um, now, you set out your kind of vision at the start there, and it's pretty radical, you know, because you are talking about change, you know, from the 
from right across the board and, and including uh, teacher training and, and including the system of education uh, and the religious division and tackling all of that. Um, so what's your idea as somebody who's engaged in politics of persuading people for, for addressing the, the vested interests rather than being seen as a threat, as offering people you know, a way forward on this? Um, you mentioned, for instance, you know, for instance, from a nationalist point of view, a need to reform education in the South. Uh, so is that so how you perhaps say persuade people in your own community that this is you know a model for something that will will take things forward politically uh, rather than a threat to say you know catholic education or a threat to nationalist culture i don't i would i would first start off by saying um you called it radical there and i would i would agree in some way but i do think it's what's needed um we could call it a uh, radical but i do think it is necessary and sometimes radicalism is needed a wee bit in um, how we look at things. You know, we do need that root and branch approach that I mentioned before. It's not, um, I don't think we can go halfway with this. And at the end of the day, um, Kevin made a very good point about how, you know, we need to democratize schools in some way. I don't think that taking the sort of vested interests out of um, the management or the, the administration of the education system or schools um, is something that should be seen as a threat. I think it's something that should be seen as encroaching on modern, on modern and, and, and what is needed. I mean, I do a lot of work with the secondary students union in um, the North and they're fantastic. Um, I mean, you know, I was almost going to say I would, I would trust them to run my school. Um, I don't go to school anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I suppose that wouldn't be fair to say, but, um, you know, there, there is a need for um, students to have a say in their own education. And even if you're looking, at um, the economic background around our education system at the moment. I mean, it is completely unsustainable. I do think we need to move to a shared institute for education in the North, because at the end of the day, at the moment, you could argue that we are just producing teachers for export um, across to Britain um, or other places. I mean, at the moment, I think it was something like uh, 140 um, per annum oversupply in the next decade that I read in one of the papers um, produced by Ulster and it's just not sustainable. We do need um, a radical approach on how we change things um, and moreover I think that there's a lot to be said as well. I think we raised the point about St Mary's there and how we would deal with um, sort of altering how uh, the local economy and, and the working class community um, would operate in that setting if we were to remove some areas. I don't see any reason why if, you know, we were to go ahead with this, um, you know, one institute for education in the North, it couldn't be based in that area, but then um, it, it could very well not be based in that area as well. But I do think that there's a lot, a need for forward planning there. I don't think that that um, one obstacle will wreck the whole project, you know what I mean? Um, and I do think that there's an essential role it has to be played if we're going to argue for integrated education we have to argue argue in some part for integrated housing um which is quite a you know thing i think that is must out on a lot over 90 percent um i think it was actually right on 90 percent could be over and um, but i think it was 90 percent of housing executive estates and um, in 2011 were predominantly one religion he even raised the point before um about you know he hadn't met um feel free to correct me here Kevin. i think you said you hadn't met um a, a protestant until about the age of 12 or something like that and um, that's not uncommon and i know people who haven't met um you know somebody from the other community and um, the other majority community i should say uh till the age is about 16 until they go into the workplace and um, maybe in a part-time job i was quite uh you know lucky that i managed to get into the local grammar school um, I don't, I, I consider myself to be quite privileged and quite lucky in that regard, but I would argue that in some way I experienced a kind of integrated education in that um, my school was majority Protestant unionist background um, kids, but was sort of mixed as well in terms of socioeconomic perspective, um, you know, half working class, half sort of middle class um, population in the school, but I would say that it really diversified my outlook. I come from a mixed family myself. Um, my dad, Protestant from Bangor, and um, my mom's a, a Catholic nationalist from the Vogue side. So, you know, I would argue that it's sort of my um, my vision um, in terms of integrated education is 
not just um it is in most part a system which prioritizes a fair and equal education for everyone uh Keevan quoted uh, about jeremy corbyn and the escalator um thing earlier the idea of that about being able to get on and get off at any point in your life and i do think that's the way forward is a fair education system but i think the way forward for an education system in northern ireland starts with actually um diversifying and sharing our education system there shouldn't be um the religious division i think we need to overcome it and i think the best way um for this by us all working together to actually tackle um both the socio-economic background um the the sort of unless we want to bus kids to school and that sort of idea um then we're going to have to tackle integrated housing and we're going to have to tackle the um ccms the administration of schools and the institute of education and having a shared one instead of um wasting all this money on four different um four different pathways i do think that uh, the way forward is um by progressing our education policy not looking back not looking um to stay where we are we need change and we need it now and we've needed it for the past 20 30 years very good okay wilson thanks very much uh carl i'm going to ask you all just sort of a almost like a one word answer on this one because we have ended up talking uh primarily about integration um but maybe because it is one of the issues that cuts across all the different uh kind of issues within education the moment, the sectors but there's so much to it you know we could spend a couple of hours talking about say you know academic selection we could spend another couple of hours talking about what an alternative model for that would be. Um, but if we were to take away you know, the central thesis, maybe in the presentation, starting with this idea of aiming for a single kind of unified system of education and the management structures to, to, to meet that, uh, that are much more uh, you know, efficient and streamlined from what we currently have. Um, could I ask you all really essentially in a word or a sentence, do you think um, that a single system and call it an integrated system, if you will, is, is the kind of goal, is the end point of what the review should be. Yes, I think if you were to design an education system for Northern Ireland from scratch now, you certainly wouldn't have um, what we have now currently. Um, I think we all admit there needs to be some change and uh, I hope that there will be political will and leadership to do that. Uh, and uh, Keevan. Yeah, look, I think our, our uh, education system needs to be equitable and um, it needs to be future focused and it needs to be um, pupil orientated. So I think that's the way forward in my view. So Ben, do you agree that the, the, the key objective is to reach that single educational system cannot be achieved? Yeah, 100%. I think there's a few systems in Northern Ireland would see, love to see unified across uh, those divisions that exist. And that's absolutely one of them. As long as it's acknowledging of differences and helping you know, our young people to understand them and have more appreciation for each other, that's a big priority. And, and finally, Carl. Yes, um, I do. And I think that education is the tool um, that we need to use to tackle and uh, promote social mobility and cohesion. Um, because that's what the future of Northern Ireland and um, Ireland itself requires. Uh, and can I come back to you, Matt? Uh, you know, you, you, you were challenging with your presentation earlier there and, and you've heard from uh, our four uh, young politicians, if you like. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on where this goes? Because you'll have seen previous reviews, previous changes, previous promises, um, you know, Forgive me for being sceptical too. Uh, are we likely to see any radical change coming out of this one? We live in hope. We live in hope, Jim. Uh, I think that I have been involved in um, uh, research into, um, into the teacher exception from fair employment. Uh, that was the focus of my PhD. By the way, Kevin, I'm uh, started my PhD uh, on my 53rd birthday, so uh, I am an example of uh, of this person that dips in and out of education all the way through. Um, but okay. uh, at the start of my research, there was a debate in Stormont uh, on uh, on the repeal of the uh, of the exception. It was tabled by uh, by the Unionist Party, uh, and uh, the. The motion was brought down by a petition, a joint petition of concern from Sinn Féin and the SDLP. Uh, so the uh, effectively a veto on the repeal of the teacher exception. During the course of my research, I engaged with uh, with a number of politicians, 
uh, including the uh, the educational spokespersons from uh, Sinn Féin and SDLP. And I know that uh, the uh, Sinn Féin spokesperson had brought the uh, the a motion to the uh, to the Sinn Féin Ardèche that uh, the Sinn Féin would back a repeal of the uh, of the fair, uh, fair employment order to include teachers. So. Uh, and subsequent de debates in Stormont have shown now that the SDLP is also in support of a repeal of the fair employment legislation. So there is change, uh, and there is change uh, in uh, based on evidence, based on uh, uh, on fundamental acceptance of uh, of certain values uh, and values of the way we want to see our society develop in the in the future. So. While the history of uh, of education policy is littered with failed initiatives to uh, to create radical change, I think there is perhaps a, a window that we can have something special happening with this uh, with this review. Uh, and I think certainly, if the voices that I'm hearing this morning, uh, this afternoon, today, uh, are anything to go by, uh, I'm uh, I'm very optimistic. That's good to hear. Um, so um, to our panel, you've made uh, Matt optimistic and someone who's maybe seen a few um, reviews or changes or inquiries uh, before. Um, just going to sort of start bringing things to a close, um, but I want to get one last word from each of you, the panelists, uh, and that is on ensuring that you get the best out of this review, because one of the problems with reviews, sometimes it's you know, how they're set up, it's um, how they're steered and, and then ultimately how their results are presented. Um, do you think the parties at Stormont are capable of ensuring that they're all behind the concept of the review and that they design a process and are, are backing the process uh, so that when it comes out with its results, they're willing to engage with them uh, openly uh, and without, you know, uh, dismissing them before they've had a fair hearing? Uh, and I'll start, uh, Connie, with you. Yeah, I mean, certainly we are behind this review. Um, I think during the last talks process, um, which resulted in the new decade, new approach agreement, um, Alliance MLAs were the ones who really pushed to ensure that um, independent review of education was in there. I actually think a senior civil servant told our MLAs that either half of that got through and we have it now, so we can make progress. Certainly absolutely committed to it and um, it really should be one of the priorities for our executive. Um, one of the key issues um, that the panel will be considering, though, is the education journey and outcomes of children and young people. Um, so I think it's really, really important that we take those voices on board. Um, children and young people are the ones who are currently going through our education system and have the most experience of that. I think it's really important that we cooperate their voices and their experiences into this so that they can really shape um, how our education system is going to be delivered and the recommendations the panel make. Um, once we have those recommendations, I think it's step then, of course, crucial that, role, that bodies such as the Secondary Students Union and the youth forums then keep the pressure on our politicians to deliver. Because I think, as Stephen said in the initial um, presentation, we can't afford not to do this. Um, you know, reform of education is something that just has to happen. So, Connie, uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think just as the same way the executive have taken the politics out of health as such as is um, in terms of reform in the health service, I think we need to nearly do the same on education and just take the, the sort of communal and the, 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 the focus on the political out of the, out of the educational um, sector. So the, the way I would take it forward certainly be listen to the communities, listen to pupils and listen to parents, analyse the evidence that comes out of this review. And then the executive as a whole, I think, needs to land at an agreed position and once that position is agreed, deliver on it. I think it's easier said than done, but um, it's certainly something that needs to be done. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a bit of collective effort as well. So that's just the position I think we need to get to, and I'm sure that would be um, the same as everyone else on the call today. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, Carl? Yes, um, I do think it's easier said than done, but I think that changing the face of the education system um, in, in the North it's a big task, uh, and what we really need to do is unite um, all the communities in the North, not just Unionist, Nationalist, um, Protestant, Catholic. Every single community in the North um, needs to feel as though they're sharing the, the education system going forward. 
And I think the review obviously is the first step in that. Um, it'll require huge amounts of cross-party, cross-community effort. Um, but that's what it's all about is, is community. Schools are the heart um, of communities in a lot of uh, places. And at the end of the day, um, how the school looks will influence how the community looks as well. Uh, so hopefully, um, I think I'm, I'm probably mirroring Matt in some way and saying that I have huge amounts of hope and ambition um, for this going forward. Let's just hope it lives up to the hype. Good stuff. Okay, and Ben, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I think I, I completely agree with uh, Carl there that we've all got a bit of hopeful optimism and, you know, we'll be disappointed if we get burned. I think looking into looking towards this review, there's a lot of problems and hopefully we can hope that just one sweep we can deal with lots of it. The problem for education is there, there probably always will be something, especially in our wee country, but, you know, we've just got to attack the problems as they come. I think uh, the panel today, we've all sort of alluded to, you know, there also needs to be that sort of re prioritization of you know what defines success is not necessarily grades and it's not necessarily going down that massively academic route it could be apprenticeships and more funding to apprenticeships and uh, you know we need to uh, say that you know that it's that Einstein quote you know it's everyone's a genius but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it'll think it's an idiot you know uh, we need to look into that sort of stuff and fund those apprenticeships and those different routes because currently there's so many that are just burning out because they're trying to go down a road that isn't meant for them uh, so hopefully stuff like that that'll all be covered by this review and uh, hopefully we'll see some good change in the next few years very many thanks indeed okay well, listen thank you all so much uh, for your contributions that was excellent thanks very much uh, to all of our panelists uh, from our four parties who took part in the discussion today thanks indeed to matt uh, for joining us uh, from us university and to the presentation he gave also uh, with stephen earlier thanks to everyone at the uh, iaf the integrated education fund who has helped organize uh, this event about the future of our education system and thanks indeed uh, to the festival to feel and for uh, organizing this debate and many others uh, throughout the festival hope you've enjoyed watching it uh, engaging uh, with uh, the issues uh, and uh, perhaps uh, taking uh, that change forward from me, Jim Fitzpatrick. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>